from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are live in Seattle for KubeCon 2018, CloudNativeCon. This is theCUBE, I'm John Furrier, your host with Stu Miniman. Our next guest is Ashesh Badani, who's the Vice President and General Manager of Cloud Platforms at Red Hat. Great to see you, welcome back to theCUBE. Thanks for having me on, always good to be back. So you guys, again, we talk every year with you guys, it's almost like a check-in. So what's new? We've got some big, obviously the news is about the IBM, we don't really want to get into that detail. I know you, there's a, kind of a, uh, a stop on that, because it's already out there. But you guys had great success with um, Path, Platform as a Service. Now you got the growth of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon, 8,000 attendees, end users, there's uptake. What's the update on the Red Hat side? Um, yeah, so we're excited, excited to be back um, at uh, KubeCon, uh, bigger and better than it's ever been, um, I think, so that's fantastic. Uh, we've been investing in this community for over four years now, since 2014 really, from the earliest days. Uh, based our entire platform on it, um, continue growing that, right? Uh, adding lots of customers across the world. Right, and, and I think what's really been gratifying for us to see is just the diversity um, of participants, both from an end user perspective, as well as a wider ecosystem, right? So whether you're a storage player, networking player, management, monitoring, what have you, everyone's sort of building around this ecosystem, so um, I think we're creating a great amount of value and we're seeing diverse applications being So you guys have been good bet on Kubernetes, obviously uh, good timing, a lot of things are going on. This show is an open source community, right? And that's been a great thing. This is where it's kind of the end users come from. But two other personas come in that we're seeing participate heavily. The IT pro, the IP expert, and then the classic developer. So you have kind of a melting pot of how this is kind of horizontally yeah. connecting. Yeah. You guys have been successful on the IT side. Where is this impacting the end users? How is this open source movement impacting IT specifically? And at the end of the day, the developers who are writing code, yeah have to get more stuff out. What's your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, so you know, we hosted OpenShift Commons yesterday. OpenShift Commons, for the folks who don't know, is our gathering of uh, participants you know, within the larger um, OpenShift community. Uh, we had lots of end users come and talk about you know, the reason they're adopting a Kubernetes-based platform is to get greater productivity. Right, so for example, if you're uh, someone like Progressive Insurance, an established organization, um, how do you release applications quicker? How do you make your developers more productive? How do you enable them to have you know, more languages, tools, frameworks uh, at their disposal to be able to compete you know, in this world where you've got startups, you've got you know, other companies trying to compete aggressively with you. So I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a big tent here, right? You know, it's not just for, if you will, traditional IT, but it's for, if you will, companies of all sizes. Yeah. Yeah, Ashesh, when you talk about customers, every customer is, is different, and they've got really, uh, you, you look at IT, everything's additive, it tends to be a bit of a heterogeneous mess uh, when you get there. Help connect with us, you know, what are you hearing from customers? How does, uh, not just Kubernetes, but everything going on here in the cloud native environment, how's right. it helping them, how's it changing the way that they do their business, and how's Red Hat involved? So one thing we've been noticing is, uh, Hybrid cloud is here and here to stay, right? So we've consistently been hearing this from customers. Um, they've invested you know, lots of you know, money and time, energy, skills in their existing environments, um, and they want to take advantage of public clouds. But they want to do that with flexibility, with portability um, to, to, to bring to bear. Um, what we've been trying to do is focus on exactly that, right? How do we help solve that problem? How do we provide an abstraction? How do we provide you primitives, right? So, for example, this week we announced um, you know, our support of Knative and how we'll make that available as part of OpenShift. Why is that? Well, how can we provide you know, serverless primitives within the platform so folks can have you know, the flexibility to be able to adopt next generation technologies, but to be able to do that consistently regardless of where they deploy it. Yeah, uh, so I, I love that. Talk about you know, meeting the customers there. Uh, one of the things that really strikes me, there's so much change going on in the industry, and that, that's an area actually Red Hat has a right. couple decades right. of experience. Right. Uh, maybe help you know, explain how Red Hat is bringing some of that you know, enterprise oversight and uh, just, just like they've done for Linux for a long time. Yeah, yeah, Stu, so you've been you know, following us very closely <laughs> as of you, John, and the, the team at theCUBE. Um, you know, we're trying to embrace that change as it comes upon us. So, I think the last time I was here, I was here with uh, Alex Polvi of CoreOS, right? Red Hat acquired CoreOS yeah. in January. Great deal. Uh, yeah, big, big acquisition Great, yeah. for us. 
And, and now we're starting to see the fruits of some of that labor, uh, you know, in terms of integrating that technology in. Um, why did we do that? Uh, we wanted to get more automation into the platform, right? So customers have said, hey look, you know, I, I want these clusters to be more self-managing, self-healing. Uh, and so we've been really focused on saying how can we take those challenges that customers have, bring that directly into platform so they're performing more and more like the expectation that they have in the public cloud, but in these diverse heterogeneous environments. That speaks to the operating model of cloud, I and mean, you guys have a holistic view. Because you're Red Hat, you get a right. lot of customers. You get the DevOps model, you got the Kubernetes container orchestration, microservices. How does that all connect together for the customer? I mean, is it turnkey and open shift? You guys had that nice bet with CoreOS, pays and paying huge dividends. Right. What are some of those fruits in the operating model? So as a customer has to think about the systems. Yeah, yeah. It's a systems model, right? right. I mean, it's operating right. system, so to speak. Um, but they still got to develop and build apps. Right. So you got to have a systems holistic view, and be able to deliver the value. Where does it all connect? What's, right. your, what's your explanation? So distributed systems are complex, right? And you know, we're at the point where no individual can keep track of the hundreds, the thousands, the hundreds of thousands of containers that are running. So the only way then to do it is to be able to say, you know, how can the system be smart, right? So you know, at the Commons yesterday, we had sort of a tongue-in-cheek slide, right, that said, uh, the factory of the future will only have two employees, a man and a dog, right? Uh, the, the man's there to feed the dog, and the dog's in place to ensure the man doesn't go off and you know, actually touch the equipment. <laughs> and, and the point really being, you know, how can we bring technology that can bring that to bear? So one example of that is actually through our Coros acquisition. The Coros team was working on a technology called operators, right, which is to say, how can we take the human knowledge that exists to take complex ISV you know, software that's built by third parties and bring that natively into the platform and then have the platform go and manage that on behalf of the actual customer itself. Um, now we've got you know, uh, over 60 companies building operators and we've in fact taken the entire OpenShift platform, put operators to work, right? So it's completely automated and self-managing. The trend of hybrid is hot. You mentioned it's here to stay. We would argue that it's going to be a gateway to multi-cloud. Right. And as you look at the stacks that are developing and the choices, the old concept of a stack, and Chris was on earlier, CTO of CNCF, and I kind of agree with him. The old notion of a stack is changing because you got a horizontally yeah. scalable cloud fabric, you got specialty with machine learning at the top, you got a whole new kind of stack model. Yeah. But multi-cloud is what the customers want choice for. Red Hat's been around long enough to know what the multi-vendor word was years ago. Multi-vendor choice, multi-cloud choice, similar Paradigms happening yeah. now. Yeah. Modern version of multi-vendor is multi-cloud. Yeah. How do you guys see the multi-cloud evolution? So we keep investing in helping to make that a reality. Right? So last week we made some announcements around uh, OpenShift Dedicated. OpenShift Dedicated is, is uh, the OpenShift managed service on AWS. Um, OpenShift is available in ways where it can be self-managed directly by customers in a variety of environments, right? Directly run it on any public cloud or OpenStack or a virtualized environment. Uh, we have third-party partners, for example, DXC, ATOS, T-Systems, providing managed versions of OpenShift, and then you can have Red Hat manage OpenShift for you, uh, for example, with, on AWS, or uh, coming next year with uh, Microsoft through a partnership for OpenShift on Azure. Um, so you as a customer now have, you know, I think more choice than you ever had before yeah. in terms of you know, adopting DevOps or developing these microservices, but then having flexibility with regard to taking advantage of tools or services that yeah. are coming from you know, pretty much every corner of the IT industry. You guys have a huge install base. You've been servicing customers for many, many years, decades. Highest level support. Take us through what a customer, a traditional Red Hat customer that might not be fully embracing the cloud in the past now is onboarding to the cloud. What's the playbook? What, what do you guys offer them? How do you engage with them? What's the playbook? Is it you know, just buy OpenShift? Is there a series of, right. how do you guys bring that Red Hat core Linux right. customer that's been on-prem, maybe a little bit of shadow IT in the cloud saying, hey, we're doing a digital transformation. Yeah. What's the playbook? So great question, John. So first of all, in digital transformation, you know, it might, might be an overhyped term, right? Or might be a peak hype. It's kind of real. Uh, <laughs> at this point <laughs> in time. Um, but I think that the bigger point, you know, from my perspective is how do you move, you know, more dollars, more euros, more spend towards innovation, right? That's what, you know, every company is sort of trying, trying to do. So our focus is how can we build on the investments that they've made, right? In, in, at this point in time, Red Enterprise Linux probably has 50,000 customers, right? So pretty much every customer any size around the world, right, is some kind of you know, Linux user. Um, how can we then say, how can we now provide you a platform to have greater agility and 
uh, be able to develop these services quicker, but at the same time, not forget the things that enterprises care about. So last week we had uh, our first, um, you know, big sort of, you know, uh, security um, uh, sort of issue released on Kubernetes, right? The privilege escalation flaw. Uh, and so, you know, obviously we participated in the community, um, had a bunch of folks along with others um, addressing that, and then we rolled out patches. Our patch rollout went back all the way to version 3.2. 3.2 shipped in early 2016. Now, on the one hand, you say, hey, everyone is DevOps, why do you need to have you know, a patch for something that's from 2016? That's because customers you know, still aren't moving as quickly yeah. as we'd like, right? So, I just want to temper, right? There's an enthusiasm with regard yeah. to everyone's quick, everything's lightning fast. At the same time, we often find, and so going back to your question, yeah. we often find, you know, some enterprises, you know, will just take a little bit longer in reality to kind of well, you know, get to Well, mission critical workloads, they're not going to be moving overnight. That's right. So there's some legacy from those workloads. Right, right. And so what we want to do is ensure, for example, the platform, um, you know, so you know, we talked about sort of security and lifecycle, but is supporting, you know, these cloud native, you know, next generation, stateless applications, but also established legacy stateful applications all on the same platform, right? And so the work we're doing, right, is to ensure we don't, you know, it's like no, leave no application behind, right? Yeah. So either the work that we'll do, for example, with Red Hat Innovation Labs to help sort of move that forward, or with, you know, GSIs, Global System Integrators, Regional System Integrators, yeah. to bring those to bear. Yeah, Ashesh, I, I wonder if we could drill a little bit that, that there's a lot of retraining that needs to happen. Uh, you know, I've been reading lots uh, on there. It's, it's not, oh, I, I bring in this new cloud native team that's just going to totally revamp it and right. you know, take my old admins and you know, fire them all. It's like, that's right. not the reality. Right. There's not enough trained people yeah. to do all of this wonderful stuff. I mean, we see how many people right. are at this show. Explain what Red Hat's doing, some yeah. of the, the training, maturation, education paths. Yeah, so, so we do a lot of work on the just core training aspect, learning service, is, right, get folks up to speed, you know, the work, there's work that happens, for example, in CNCF, uh, but we do the same thing around, you know, um, certifications around, you know, administering the systems, um, developing applications, and so on. Um, so that's one aspect, right, that sort of you need to be uh, learned. Um, but then there's another aspect, right, with regard to how do we get the actual platform itself to be smart enough to do things that in the past that individual people had to do, right? So for example, if we were to sort of play out the operator vision, you know, you know, fully and through execution, in the past perhaps you needed, you know, several database admins. But if you had operators built for databases, you know, which for example, Couchbase and Mongo and others have built out, you can now run those within the platform and then that goes and manages on behalf. Now you don't need as many database admins, you free those people up now to build actual business innovation value, right? So I think what we're trying to do is you know, increasingly think about how we sort of, if you will, move value up the stack to free up resources to kind of work on building the next generation of services. And I think we think that's how digital transformation will occur. Yeah. And I think, even though digital transformation is totally overhyped, which I agree, it actually is really relevant because I think the cloud wave right now has been certainly validated, but what's recognized is that people have to reimagine their, their, how they do their infrastructure. Right. And IT is programmable, you're seeing at the network. I mean, right. look, the holy trinity of IT is storage, networking, and compute, right? right. So when you start thinking about that in a way that's cloud-based, it's going to require them to, I don't want to say re-platform, but really move to an operating environment yeah. that's different, yeah. that they used to have. And I think that is real. I mean, we're seeing evidence of that. Okay, with that in mind, what's next? What do you guys got on the horizon? What's, uh, What's, what's the momentum here? What's the most important story that you guys are telling here at Red Hat and what's, what's around the corner? Yeah, so you know, obviously I, I talked about a few you know, announcements that we made right around OpenShift Dedicated and you know, the upgrades around that. You know, things like, for example, supporting bring your own cloud. So if you've got your own Amazon security credentials, you know, we help support that and, and uh, uh, manage that on your behalf as well. Um, we've talked this week about our support of Knative, right? Trying to sort of introduce you know, more yeah. serverless technologies um, into OpenShift. Uh, we announced uh, the uh, contribution of etcd uh, to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, you know, so continuing reaffirming our commitment uh, to the community. I think looking ahead, going forward, right, our focus next year will be on OpenShift 4, which will be the next release of the platform. Uh, and, and there it's all about how do we give you a much better install and upgrade experience uh, than you've had before. How do we give you these, you know, um, clusters that you can deploy in multiple different environments and manage that you know, better for you. How do we introduce operators to bring more and more automation to the platform? Yeah. So for the next you know, few months, right, you know, our focus is on 
you know, creating greater automation in the platform and then enabling more and more services yeah. to be able to run on that. Been exciting for you guys riding the wave, the cloud wave, pretty dynamic, you know, a lot of action. Right. You guys had great success, congratulations. Thank you very Been much. Been fun to watch. It's theCUBE coverage here. We're in Seattle for CubeCon 2018 and Cloud Native Con. I'm John Horst Duminim. Stay with us for more coverage at day one of three days of coverage after this short break. We'll be right back. Thank you.